Welcome to the show. In this episode, we're going to be building and testing a couple of popular DIY camp stoves. Now, there's a lot of stoves out there to choose from, and that's half the fun of DIY. I chose two of the more common stoves to test today, and just to keep the results from being repetitive, each of them will be using a different fuel source. Today, we're testing the Buddy Burner and the Pop Can Stove, or Soda Can Stove, depending on what your preference is. We're going to build them and test them, and then run them head-to-head -head against a couple of powerhouses just to see how they stack up. So let's get on with the build. The Pop Can Stove, one of my personal favorites. For the Pop Can Stove, you're going to need two Pop Cans, some gloves for safety, a pair of scissors, a ruler and a sharpie, and a knife. I'm just going to use the one from my multi-tool. The video you're watching is a build for my side jet stove, which I'm not done yet. But the build is identical. The only suggestion I would make is to pop holes in the top of the cap before you start removing the centerpiece. Now let's get started. Your measurements may vary depending on how large a stove you want, so I'm just going to give you some basic guidelines. Take your first can and measure about 3.5 centimeters from the bottom, then mark that with your sharpie. Now draw a line around the can at that height. You can use just about anything to do this, so I use my multi-tool. Next, punch yourself a pilot hole for the scissors to go through. Then, take your scissors and cut just a little bit above the line. We'll do a more precise cut next. Once the bottom of your can is free from the bulk and easier to work with, take your time and make a fine cut around the line. Now, depending on how fresh your can is, you may need to draw out the inside. When you're satisfied that the bottom of your stove is done, set it aside for later. Now we're going to make the inner wall. Try to scavenge as much of the aluminum as you can. It's going to want to curl on you, so you can flatten it out on the edge of your desk. And now to make the top of the stove. Take the second can and your knife and start removing the center. There are many ways to do this, I'll just show you the way I do it. Hold the can with a gloved hand in case you slip with your knife. Second, using your knife, start scoring the edge of the center part of the can. You can follow the bend that's already there for you. This works best if you go around a few times. Now, you can keep going around until the center pops out, or you can start scoring an X into the bottom of the can. Again, remember to score it about three times. Now, take your knife and start popping the center of the can out. You might have to do this a few times. If there's any left, just take your gloved hand and start popping all the pieces into the can. You won't need to pull them out since we're cutting the bottom of the can off anyways. Now it's time to start cutting this can down to size. You can measure this one again, or just use your first can as a template. The process here is pretty much the same. Poke yourself a pilot hole for your scissors to go through, and start giving yourself a rough cut. And now that the bulk is gone, give yourself a nice fine detailed cut along your line. After some measurements and some comparing, I found out that my center wall should be about 5 centimeters tall. After measuring and marking my line with a straight edge, I cut out my center wall. Now there are many ways to make the inner wall stay. I found one of the easiest ways was to roll the center wall up tightly so it would hold its own shape. Don't forget to cut some slits into the center wall for the fuel to pass through. Now take your center wall and insert it into the bottom of the stove, making sure the fuel holes are on the bottom. Now comes the most time consuming process. It's time to fit the two cans together. There are many ways to do this. One of the most popular ways is to cut or fold the inside of the can. However, this could cause a crease that could eventually cause a tear or leak. For this stove, I took the outside can and placed it over a full can and expanded the bottom. As you can see here, the expansion is rather visible. By using a spare piece of aluminum as a shim, it can go together pretty easily. Now that's it, your stove is done. The only difference is your holes should be on the top. Now to make the simmer cap, grab one of your cans and remove the top piece. Try to cut as close to the bend as you can. Also, don't forget to remove the piece in the bottom. Just bend it back and forth a few times until it snaps, as well as don't forget to remove the tab. You can use your multi-tool to remove any remaining pieces. And that's pretty much it, that's your simmer cap. Now I have made rice using a simmer cap like this before, so I know it works. Feel free to try out other designs, maybe you might come up with something even better. Also, since this design is very difficult to blow out, you might also want to make yourself a snuffer cap to turn it off. However, this design does not work on a side jet stove. There are a variety of fuels you can use with this stove, the most common being denatured alcohol. For this test, we're just going to use fondue fuel since it's all I have available. The downside of fondue fuel is that it has a blue dye in it which does leave a colored residue behind, but it has no smell and is very clean burning. I made my first penny stove about 8 years ago, and I've used it several dozen times over. However, it does have a few limitations, such as it has to be primed, and it can easily be blown out. I really like this design for a pop can stove. It is very lightweight, and it's very reliable. It's self-priming, which is a bonus, and it's very difficult to blow out. For the buddy burner, you're going to need a small can. Most people use something like a tuna fish can. However, due to modern canning techniques, many cans employ a type of coating on the inside that can become toxic when burned. Therefore, I chose this little candy tin. It also had a lid, which I found very useful. As with most of my projects, I'm going to try to use my multi-tool as much as I can. 
You're also going to need a straight edge of some sort. I used a ruler. You're also going to need a sharpie. There are many things you can use as a wick. I chose some cardboard. Also, get yourself some sturdy gloves, something to melt wax in. I chose an old soup can and a fuel source. I had an old candle lying around that I had no intentions on burning. If you're able to do so, pull out the wick. If you're not, you can pull the wick out once the wax melts. Now, before your can gets full of molten wax and too hot to handle, bend a pouring spout into the end of the can. Remember to use your gloves. For safety purposes, we're going to be employing the double boiler technique for melting the wax. Now remember, it doesn't take a lot of heat to melt wax, so keep your temperature on a medium-low setting. While keeping a close eye on your melting wax, we're going to get started on the wick. Make sure the corrugations are pointing up and down. Then, use your can to mark the height of the cardboard strips. Now, with your sharpie and straight edge, mark a line for you to cut along. Now, with some knife or some scissors, cut your strip of cardboard out. You should be able to use the first cardboard strip as a template for the rest of your strips. The size of your can will determine how many strips you need, so be prepared to cut a few. Use your can to compare the height of your strips. If your cuts are sloppy or too tall, give them a trim. Now take your strip and start rolling them into coils. Now remember, there is no need to pack them too tightly. This is going to be a wick after all. As you can see, my first attempt wasn't quite large enough, so I had to cut a few more strips. Now take your coil and insert it into your can. It should fit nice and snug. I knew I wanted to use a lid for this can, and I noticed some of the cardboard was still protruding out of the top of the can. So, using some scissors, I gave it a trim. A final test on my can was good for the next step. If you want to put a wick in your buddy burner for easier lighting, it's best to do it now before you fill it full of wax. I had been keeping a close eye on the melting wax, and I noticed that the levels were getting close to the top, and I still had a lot of wax to go. So using some gloves, I removed the can from the water, and slowly started pouring the wax into the buddy burner. I placed a piece of cardboard underneath to contain any spills. While I waited for the rest of the wax to melt, I thought about how to start this little guy. In the past, I simply roughed up the surface with my knife and lit any protruding cardboard. But since I had the time, I thought about adding a wick. I just used a small piece of cardboard that I could easily fold down as to not affect the lid. Once that was done, I then poured the remaining wax into the buddy burner. Remember to give the cardboard time to soak up the wax and let any air bubbles out. And that's pretty much it. Once the wax hardens, you're good to go. There's a lot of videos out there showing literally hundreds of designs on these stoves. I just chose two of the most popular ones. However, some of the boil tests you might see are usually done indoors with room temperature water. Now, I wanted to get myself a couple of real world results. So, we did our tests outside in the wind and the rain using ice cold water, similar to what you might find in a stream. So here are some of the weather conditions at the beginning of testing.
So tell me what you think of the new format. I tried to make the data a little bit more visible. Now, my test was far from perfect. I did forget to hit the record button once or twice, and my starting temperature of the water was not always the same, and I didn't predetermine or define boiling point, but that would have only affected the test results very slightly. Now keep in mind, these are only the results of my test. Your results most likely will vary. I think it'd be great if you boasted a video response based on your own results, especially based on different designs, fuel types, and the environment in which you're testing in. Now I like this little stove. It's very versatile and you can use a variety of fuels in there. It's very common to see these stoves being made with paraffin wax as it's easy to come by. You can usually find it in the canning aisle. I've also seen these stoves being made with crayons and in some extreme cases even vegetable oil. When not in use, the fuel is in a solid state. So that's going to make this safe for transport as well as you're not going to have a spill hazard when it's in storage. It has an incredibly long shelf life so a lot of people like to stock up on something like this. Go make a couple of dozen. They can also be used as a heat source like a campfire. We did this actually at the lake uh, not long ago and it turned out quite well. My first design I used a ton of cardboard and got as much as I could in there. And with a little amount of wax we were only able to get maybe three hours tops out of our little stove. Another nice thing is this thing can actually be refilled while operating. You can actually just take like a stick or some tongs and you can actually put uh, chunks of wax onto the burner while it's operating, which is kind of a nice little feature. It's pretty rare to be able to refill something while it's operating. Like I said earlier, it has a pretty decent burn time. The first stove I made, we were able to get about three hours of it, but like I said, it was completely filled with cardboard. Uh, with my second design, as you saw in the build, um, there's a lot more room in there to probably fit a lot more wax. Another thing is they're very economical to make. You're making this thing pretty much out of stuff you're finding in your recycling bin. Old cardboard, old cans, uh, candle stubs. I had a full candle that I didn't plan on burning and the thing worked great. Another thing is it's less volatile in the event of tipping. I have been in a situation where a stove was tipped over and they had a fuel fire on their hands. With this situation, you're just going to get a bunch of wax everywhere. It burns dirty. It gives off kind of like a sooty smoke. While it's not black smoke, you can see it gets pretty sooty, especially when the stove gets pretty hot. We actually put a windscreen around the stove first, and that's when the stove really got a chance to heat up. And then you can see a lot of soot coming out of the stove. And I just took the windscreen off, and as the wind came by, it cooled the stove down. It wasn't so bad. Another thing about the sooty smoke is it can blacken your pots and pans and your windscreen. If you look in the earlier test, you can see flames coming up the side of the pot. I got my pot quite black as well as my stand for my pot and even my windscreen. Now be careful with the windscreen because your cute little cat might decide it's a fun toy to play with and she will look like Michael in Mary Poppins. Another thing is it takes a little longer to get to an optimal operating temperature. That's why I did two tests, one with a cold start, one with a warm start, just to give you an idea of the difference between the two. Also, it takes longer to cool down for safe transport. While mine did have a lid on there, that's not going to stop any kind of leaks. I like the lid for keeping my other gear soot free. I mean, I've seen people actually have these. They put them in a Ziploc bag, the metal punctures the bag, get soot all over their gear. But having a nice little lid on top of there, can just, I thought, would be a good idea. Oh, this is something I noticed was quite interesting. While the wax levels were high, the thing actually can be a little volatile in the event of moisture like rain or spitting in this case. Uh, in this demonstration here, I spit on the stove just to give you an idea how big a fireball I was able to get. Once the wax levels dropped down though, I didn't have to worry about that. But it's something to keep in mind. It's essentially a grease fire. But unlike a grease fire, if it, like I said, tips over, you're not going to have a huge issue on your hands. So what can I say about these little stoves? I love these little guys. I've been using a stove like this for years, and the design we tested today is simply just one of the most common designs you'll find when doing a search on the internet. Now the most common type of fuel for this type of stove is denatured alcohol. However, depending where you live, it might be very difficult to come across. So a very common substitute is methyl hydrate. This stuff is so common you can even get it at Walmart. I got a big jug from my Home Depot for about 10 bucks. It's very simple to construct and the operation procedures are very simple. You simply ignite it, let it go, snuff it out when you're done. There are literally hundreds of designs for these kinds of stoves. In fact, this little guy right here is designed to double as a pot stand. You can put your pot right on top of here and continue cooking with it. These things are also incredibly reliable and very quiet.
If you're using some of the most common types of fuels, it's also going to be odorless. Now that can also be a negative. If you're going to be putting it in a common type bottle, mark it clearly that it is not water or something because it looks just like water and it has almost no odor to it. So right on there, fuel, do not drink. If you might be people who don't speak the same language as you, put some maybe a skull with some crossbones or something on there because it's better to be safe than sorry. The best part is if you spill on yourself, you're not going to smell like a gas station all week. Another thing is these things are very difficult to blow out. If there's a stiff wind, I have had stoves blow out on me. With this design here, it's very difficult to blow these out. So compared to the Buddy Burner, it is a very clean flame, so you don't have to worry too much about it sooting up your pots. Also, this stove is virtually maintenance free. Now on the other side of the fence, unfortunately these stoves, since they are made out of pop cans, they are pretty fragile. And so you'll have to take that into account when it comes to durability. Also, depending on what environment you're in, if it's really bright out, it's actually kind of difficult to tell if it's actually running. Some people will put their hand over there, see if they can feel some heat. That is kind of dangerous. A little trick I learned is take a little piece of grass or something and stick it over top of the flame. If the grass ignites, yeah, it's running. Also, compared to other stoves on the market, they probably don't have the highest heat output. And even compared to the Buddy Burner, we weren't getting the best heat output. But also, that will depend on what type of fuel you're using. We're, we're using fondue fuel, which is essentially methyl alcohol, which is very similar to the methyl hydrates that you can get from Home Depot. It's not the most fuel efficient stove. If you compare the weight of fuel to burn time, uh, there are some things that are considerably better. Also, your flame size is limited, so if you're cooking for a lot of people, one of these guys probably just isn't going to put out enough heat to cook for multiple people. But if you're doing something, let's say, that needs to simmer, like rice, for example, using little simmer caps like one of these, they do work quite well. I've actually made many, many bowls of rice using a simmer cap like this, and they've always worked quite well for me. However, with a simmer cap like this, you are going to have a higher risk of the flame getting snuffed out by the wind. Thanks again for watching. My next upload should be my submission to Film Rats Monday Challenge. This week we're doing slow motion, so I hope to see you there. Take care.